and welcome to the final lecture of Statistics 568 Design and Analysis of Experiments. Today we have bonus material to enjoy. It's going to be on the crossover design, a new topic. <laughs> So in the crossover design, what you're going to do is instead of giving one treatment to one subject, you're going to give every treatment to every subject, but you're going to cross them over because you can't give every treatment to every subject at the same time. So there's going to be stages to this experimental design, periods one, two, three, and so on. And in each stage, what you're going to do is you're going to swap treatment from one subject to the next. And in that way, you can use each subject to control for their, I guess, own variation. This way what we end up with is a random effect, a random subject effect that we have to take into account. But it can also give us more data and a better way to test our treatments across multiple subjects. Now there are still some problems that we have to worry about, mainly carryover effects. The idea being that if you're testing treatments sequentially, the previous treatment may still be in your system when you test the next one, and that can cause some trouble. And we're going to look into how do you deal with that um, in today's lecture. So let's get into the notes and uh, see what this is all about. And welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 568, Design and Analysis of Experiments. This is a special lecture because it's the final lecture with some content in it that isn't just review. And we've actually covered... We've actually covered all of the material that I wanted to cover in this course, which means we have time for a little bit of a bonus lecture. So the topic of today's lecture is going to be the idea of a crossover design. Now this is going to take a little bit of a different look at how we might try to design an experiment, and it's something that's very popular in medical studies, in um, what they would call sensory, I think, uh, sensory studies in the sense of if you're um, giving people um, things to taste or things to experience and you want to rate them, like you're tasting coffee or beer or wine or whatever people like to taste and rate them on, say, like the flavor and the boldness and the acidity and all this other stuff, these are often the types of designs we'd want to use because what you will have is you'll have a single subject getting exposed to multiple treatments rather than the other setting we've been considering this whole time, which is one subject, one treatment, done. Um, and this makes leads to some very interesting issues in how to set up the experiment, what problems to look out for, and how to actually run it in practice. Um, these are all different issues that we'll be addressing today. This is actually a uh, particular area of research interest for uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Alberta, Dr. Cho, who um, hopefully won't actually watch this video because if I make a mistake, it'll be blatantly obvious to her um, and hopefully not blatantly obvious to you. So how in the world do you do a crossover design? Well, let's jump into the notes and find out. All right, so the topic of today's lecture is the idea of a cross over design. It's one that you might actually have to use sometime in the future, so I think it's good to talk about um, even at the very end of our course where we won't have enough time to do it justice in its like full extent, we can still give you an idea of what to expect if you ever run into a crossover design or need to implement one yourself. So roughly um, before We had, well, effectively one treatment per subject. Now we have multiple treatments per subject. Treatments per subject, as you. We'll just sub. Right, so the idea being that, well, why test just one drug on a person when you can test all the drugs? Um, okay, you have to be a little careful about how you go about running one of these experiments. We're not just going to be giving everyone 
every treatment at once. The idea is that we run this experiment over multiple periods or rounds. And what we will do is that in each round, we give each person a different treatment in each round. So in this case, well, let's have a setup. Say we have a single, let's say four level treatment factor, experimental factor, just to, we'll say experimental factor, factor with levels, factor with uh, levels A, B, C, and D. So the setting is a little bit different here because for most of the recent lectures, we've treated A, B, C, and D as separate experimental factors. And then we've considered crossing them and interactions and whatnot. In this case, I just have a single factor and it has four levels, which we're going to denote A, B, C, and D, just because if I use numbers, it's going to get into, it's going to make things annoying when I put them into a table. Um, so just to make sure you're not confused, in this case, you can imagine A, B, C, and D as, well, four different pills or four different coffee varieties or four different wines, you know, whatever your um, beverage of choice is, four different tea, for example, types of tea. And what we're going to do is then we're going to have, let's say, we'll say, and let's say four subjects and four rounds or periods for our experiment. And what we're going to do is we're going to have our, we're going to make a table. We're going to have the subject. We're going to have the round. Let's say one, two, three, and four. We're going to have round one, two, three, and four. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to make sure that every subject gets exposed to every treatment, at least one of the different levels of our factor, I should say, in each round. So maybe the first subject just gets exposed to A, B, C, and D. Maybe the next one gets something like, I don't know, B, C, D, and A. And then maybe we have a C, D, A, and B. And what else can we have? I guess we could do a D, A, B and C. So in this case, what we have is in some sense time going down vertically and we have four different subjects. And then you stare at this and you say, hey, wait a minute, it's a Latin square. It's back yet again, the Latin square design. Um, okay, you don't have to strictly use a Latin square, but there are reasons why you would want to. The idea of completely randomizing everything because ultimately, um, we want to test, well, the treatment, of course, the treatment factor, um, but we also want to account. So there's generally one thing we want to test for, which is, is there a significant difference in our treatments? If A, B, C, and D are different coffees and we're rating them on their, I don't know, bitterness or whatever you rate coffee on, um, then, right, you could go through it and you could have different ratings for each um, coffee type and then you could aggregate them at the end. Um, so ultimately the treatment, the A, B, C, and D is what we're interested in knowing the differences of, but we have to account for, well, a couple things. One is the period or the round, I keep changing what I'm calling it, but same thing. We have to account for the fact that as you run through the experiment, things can change, right? For example, if this is some type of taste testing experiment, it's very common that by the end of it, you're a little bit tired. Maybe your, your taste buds are overloaded. You're not as keen at um, detecting those differences than you were at the start of the experiment. So that's one example. Um, 
so we would need to take into account a period effect. Um, this is fixed. And we would need to take into account a subject effect. And this would be random. So there's two different extra things in here we want to test for. We want to first account for the subjects. Every subject will behave differently. And since we have multiple observations for each subject, this is a type of something called a repeated measures design. Um, if we're repeatedly measuring a subject more than once, we can then treat the subject factor as a random effect. This is kind of like that rabbit example way back from the beginning of the course where each rabbit was exposed to every treatment. The only difference is I don't know if it was done in any specific order. I'd have to go look up wherever the documentation of where that data came from. In this case, we're assuming there is a specific order. Um, and second, yes, yeah, so we have that and we have the period, which would be again the round, uh, one, two, three, four, a four level factor, ordinal, I guess, if we want to consider it that way. Um, and it would be think, thought of as a fixed effect. And again, things can change as you go through your experiment, whether it's some type of medical trial, whether you're judging the best uh, chili or wine or whatever, um, cookies, um, whatever you're into. Um, right, things can change, we have to account for that. And now there's actually one other thing that we have to account for. Um, because if you're kind of, you know, following along and thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute. Um, if I'm, what if the previous treatment or the previous um, thing I've been exposed to affects my perception or my um, the result uh, uh, the effect of me with the with the current thing I'm being exposed to so basically the idea is that if I drink coffee a and then I drink coffee B is that going to mean that the way I experience B will be different as I already had a so if a is for example you know extremely you know, roasted and bitter and strong, and it's like, whoa, overloaded, then it might make B seem really weak and light and sort of refreshing by comparison, even if absolutely it may not be. So the idea is that there's another problem. So the problem, maybe I should have written this in red for emphasis, but we'll say problem is that the previous treatment may influence the current treatment. And this is an interesting problem, right? This is something that happens when you're running an experiment. It's something that doesn't immediately isn't immediately obvious in say the mathematics, but it's like, yeah, of course, if uh, you're running an experiment, um, depending on what you just had, you know, if you're again, if you're tasting something that can definitely affect how you perceive the next thing. And this is called a, a carryover effect. And the idea of the carryover effect is actually going to mean that that Latin square that I wrote there is actually the wrong Latin square. So as a result of this, we find out that this is a bad square. So why would that be a bad square? Well, if we notice, it's a bad square because A always followed by B and B is always followed by C and C is always followed by D and D is always followed by A. So it means that we have the same ordering within for each subject. So unless except for subject one who starts with, you know, A, that means that whenever somebody else in our design gets an A, they previously had a D come right before it. 
And that means we might be influencing it. Because again, if D is, let's say, an extremely strong flavor and A is a very light flavor, well, if A is a medium flavor, it might seem even lighter because D is so strong or vice versa. Um, and that's a problem in your design. If you were to run this, you could run into some trouble with the idea of a carryover effect. So instead, instead, we could use a Latin square like, well, this one, which I had to, well, <laughs> I found. So to make sure that I don't mess it up, um, here, we'll switch to blue. A, B, C, D, B, D, A, C, B, D, A, C, C, D, C, A, D, B, C, A, D, B, and lastly, D, C, B, A, B, A. Now, if we stare at this Latin square, we see that in the first column, A is followed by B. In the second column, A is fall or fall. Sorry, I should say um, I have it backwards. A starts it, so A is just starting it with nothing that came before it. Um, in the second column, A comes after D. In the third column, A comes after C. And then in the last column, A comes after B. So we have every predecessor before A. And if you look again, you can see the same thing happening with B, C, and D. So the idea is this is sort of a, um, well, more balanced than, I say more balanced because that's not exactly like a proper terminology, but the idea is that we talked about balanced designs. We want to make sure all of the right, the different combinations of factor levels occur. This in some sense is more balanced because it's balanced in the sense of carryover effects. The idea that, again, every guy is preceded by every other guy um, in this design. So it's a subtlety, but it's something that you could easily not think about if you're running a design and you say, OK, I've got four people, I've got four different treatments. Let's just give them to each of them in a different order. And then you think, oh, I want Latin square because that makes sense. That way I can account for period effects. But you could still get yourself into trouble with carryover effects in this type of design um, if you don't do something like this. Now, this doesn't mean that you've magically fixed the carryover problem. You just have balanced it out in some sense. Um, because there's actually even, uh, well, there's actually even a little bit more going on here, which is how do we actually run this in practice? So in practice, we would include a washout period, so-called washout period, in between um, each treatment. So I found one data set, for example, um, that's in one of these design of experiments packages in, um, in uh, R, where they look at anti-fungal lotion. Um, not sure where it's applied. I looked up the textbook, could not figure that out. Um, I don't even quite understand exactly what they're measuring. Something about plasma level, um, which I also don't quite, the, the details are kind of lacking in the textbook. But roughly, they have two different types of lotions. They have the, I guess, medicated one and the placebo one, um, I believe. And what they do is they have the subjects are split into, there's lots of subjects in this case, not just two subjects. They're split into two groups. Group one starts with the medicated lotion first. Group two starts with the non-medicated lotion. They apply it for multiple weeks. Then they all stop and they don't do anything. They get the measurements, of course, about whatever the response is they're trying to measure. Um, then they just wait for a couple weeks to let their system, I guess, reset. Then they take, they swap 
and the people who had the medicated now have the um, unmedicated and the people with the unmedicated now have the medicated and they start again. So just because I wrote say A, B, C, D, there could be um, gaps in time in here. I'll just put time gaps. Or if you're taste testing something, maybe you have to eat a whole bunch of crackers or otherwise to reset your palate, right? I'm not a, an expert in taste testing anything, so I'm not sure what the proper way to reset your palate is, but presumably, looks like I wrote gaps, not gaps, gaps, there we go. Um, right, the, there would be some type of a washout period um, that would need to be taken into account. All right, so running these things, yeah, can be a little bit complicated, um, but also testing them and being aware of those carryover effects can also be a bit complicated. So we're going to try to start with the simplest setting. Again, there's a, there's you know a lot that you can go into in this subject, um, including some master's and PhD theses written by people in our department. Um, but uh, in this case, we're just going to do the most basic setting. Um, and the most basic setting is something called an AB slash B A um, crossover design. Which basically says, take N subjects. Wow, that is n I'm not being able to write today. Take n subjects and then split in half. So n is going to be even, capital N will be even, lowercase n will be capital N over 2. Um, and then you put half, and then you basically get a table that looks like this. So we're going to say um, round one and two, and then we're gonna have group because now it's not just a single subject, it's anybody who gets assigned to group one and people who get assigned to group two. And what happens? Well, the people in group one get exposed to A and then get exposed to B, and the people in group two get exposed to B and then exposed to A, then we're done. So then you think about this, you're like, well, that looks pretty simple, right? I mean, there's probably not much going on there. Um, okay, granted, we need to account for this idea of like a washout period um, and maybe actually setting up the design might be a little bit complicated based on the physical setting. Um, it doesn't look that complicated, right? Well, it actually has some interesting complications in it. Um, so first of all, what are we doing here? Well, we have to consider the um, the model equation that we want to work with. So in this case, what we're going to have is something that's going to look like y, i, j, k. I'm going to use L. Well, I don't need k. k was always my number of treatment levels, but in this case, I'm not using k. So we're just going to use k um, as another index. And I get a mu, an si, a pi j, a tau k, and the epsilon i j k. So then the question is, well, what are all these things? Well, of course, y is just going to be our response. And what we have here, we have three different indices. We have i, which is going to be the subject, or maybe I should say ith subject we have j which is going to be the jth period and we have k which is going to be the kth treatment All right, um, and then you can take a guess at what all these symbols mean, right? Of course, we're going to have our global mean. We are going to have our subject random effect. 
because every subject might react differently. Again, if this was taste testing, somebody might have a high tolerance for bitterness or spiciness or whatever thing we're trying to measure about our hypothetical food or beverage that we're tasting. Um, this would be the period, pi, or the round. I keep switching that, sorry. Um, tau would be the treatment. And epsilon is the random noise. So what we'd want to do is we'd want to test all of these. Um, but this is also assuming... So here, what we're doing is we're assuming no carryover effect. But there could be one. Um, and if there is one, then the equation changes a bit. If I can find where the equation, well, I can just write it in. I kind of know what it's supposed to be. If we do have a carryover effect, what we're going to end up with is something like yijk. It's just the notation, which is um, a pain. Tau k. And then what we're going to have is something called lambda. Lambda is going to be the carryover effect. And this is going to be some type of, I always forget the notation they use. I'll try to look it up in a second. Um, it's always like ij. Um, not I, yeah, indicating that we have, or I guess we want um, the previous period. So we would want something like um, ij minus one in the sense that we want the effect that the previous period is having, having on our current period. Now you could imagine that there's even higher order carryover effects, but um, that's something that I haven't seen discussed. Usually the idea is that we're just going to assume that the previous round is affecting the current round in some way. All right, so then how do we analyze this type of design? All right, well, the way we might want to analyze this design is to first test to see if there is a carryover effect or not. Um, so much like uh, in the response surface section, when we talked about the idea that we can test for quadratic behavior in our response surface before collecting all the points. Well, in this case, we're collecting all the points, but we can use all of the data points to test whether or not there is a significant carryover. Um, so, right, step one might be test for any sort of carryover. The idea being that if we did a proper, we waited long enough, we have a good washout period, that there shouldn't be any significant carryover, but it might be unavoidable based on the way the experiment is run um, or the constraints that there might be some carryover effect, but we just don't know a priori. So we have to test for that. Um, so the first thing to note is a couple things. Well. If we go back to our table here, let's expand our table a little bit. <coughs> Probably not COVID, fingers crossed. So let's do round one and round two. I'm gonna give myself a little extra room and we're going to say, well, let's move this down slightly. Um, and then we're going to have group one and group two. So the idea is that we have multiple measurements. In fact, we have for each of these categories here, for each of these, I guess, two cross two, so four different categories, we have N measurements for each of the four categories being group one, group two, round one, round two, crossed with each other. Um, 
So what would happen if we uh, stared at what the effect or what the um, what our equation up here would look like in those categories? Well, if we take an expected value, right, effectively what I want to do is I want to take the expected value of y, i, j, k. And I want to shove it into this table corresponding to the four different settings, round one, round two, group one, group two. Um, so let's try round one, round, or group one, round one. So group one, round one will have, if we take the expected value, we would get a mean mu. Let's change the color to, we would get a mean mu, um, that's always there. Uh, the subject effect, so that's something that I actually forgot to mention. Um, I did say it's a random effect. Typically, that means that, um, I'll say note, we treat SI to be a normal zero sigma, well, not sigma squared, because sigma is going to be, we'll call it nu squared, random variable, and epsilon IJK is going to be a normal zero sigma squared, and these are all, uh, I need more, one more line. <laughs> They're all independent. So that's the mathematical context, right? The physical context is basically saying that every subject is gonna have a slightly different mean, a random effect, a random mean um, shift for their response. And we think of all the subjects as being independent. So as long as we don't have um, any siblings in our study or whatever, uh, we could probably reasonably assume that everyone's going to be um, independent, uh, have an independent random subject effect. And we also assume that's independent of the errors epsilon, which are just going to be our standard or kind of like general errors, right, um, for our design. Anyway, the point is that they're mean zero. So if I take an expected value, that term will disappear. And again, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be averaging all of the observations in each of these four categories. Um, but mathematically, I can just take an expected value. Mu is mu, S is zero, pi is pi, and tau is tau. But the point is, is that in this first case, we're gonna get well, pi, period one, and treatment, tau one, or one. So it's pi one. Tau one, epsilon is zero. Um, in group two, we're gonna get the same thing, but we're gonna have mu plus pi one, plus now tau two. Okay, so we have different treatments in the first round. Now for the second round, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have pi two, tau two. And now what we're going to do is we're going to include a carryover effect, which I'm just gonna call lambda one. I don't really like this, some of this notation. So basically lambda one just means I had treatment one in the previous round. Um, and similarly for this other category, I'm going to have mu plus pi two for the second round plus treatment one for what I'm being exposed to in that round plus lambda two for what I was exposed to in the previous round, right? So this is what we would get for each of these four categories. So, well, yeah, I guess this is I and J, so we should be able to use, oh good, yeah, we can use, um, so uh, to, to write this table for like the 10th time, right, what we're going to end up with is we're going to be able to average all of the observations and get something like y bar 1, 1 dot, y bar, this should be treatment 2, so it should be 2, 1 dot. I guess I could have, well, that's all right. It's not going to be in the correct row column indexing, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this is going to be one, two dot, because I, oh wait, no, this is two, two. Yeah, this is confusing with respect to um, what a uh, matrix should look like, but that's okay. 
And lastly, we'll have y bar, I guess, two or one, one, two. All right, hold on. Let me make sure we get this right. Um, ah, no, si is the subject. That's where I'm confusing myself. You know what? I'm going to get rid of the, we'll just call it mu, mu hat because the indices in this case are just horrible with all the IJKs and the subjects, which don't actually matter here. So I'm going to replace my notation and call it mu hat. Oh, but mu is mu. All right, what I'm going to call each of these entries is y bar one one for first round, first treatment, y bar one two for first round, second treatment, y bar, in this case, two, two, which isn't quite right with the matrix ordering, but that's okay. Two, two for second round, second treatment, and Y bar two, one, which is second round, first treatment. So the idea is that each of these sample means is going to be an estimator for the things above. So I basically have, well, again, these things estimate the above table right and we can use this in order to well tease out the bits that we want so given this kind of crazy looking thing i feel like i should box this off so that it's not so that's a terrible box sorry we're almost to the end of the term. It's a good enough box for that, um, right? The point is, is that we have these Y bars and we can use them to construct statistical tests for these parameters, these unknown parameters in the top box, the mu, the, well, not mu, but you know, the mu, the pi, the tau, and the lambdas. In particular, if we want to test for carryover, how would we do that? Well, what we want to do is we basically want to know, are these lambdas different from each other? So effectively, what we want to do is we want to test H0, which is lambda 1 equal to lambda 2, which would basically mean that, OK, there might be a carryover effect, but it's the same in both cases. So it would just be captured by the period. It's like saying, there's a difference between period one and period two. Uh, mainly, let's say the person's getting more fatigued by the time period two comes along, um, for example. Um, so in this case, it's kind of like there is no carryover effect because it would be sub consumed by the, the period effect. But if there's a difference, then that's something we want to detect. So this is a, this is a standard hypothesis type of two sample test that we'd want to figure out. So then how do we use the Y bars to test this? What we can do is we can combine them. So what we need to do, um, our test statistic is going to look something like, let's see if I can get this right, Y bar 1, 2 minus, is it minus, no, plus, sorry, plus, yeah, it's this, uh, this column, Y bar 1, 2, plus y bar 2, 1 divided by 2. So the average of the second column minus the average of the first column. And you could reverse this because it's going to be a t statistic, so it doesn't really matter. Now, the reason why this works is let's take an expected value and see what we get. Well, if I take an expected value of this, what I end up getting is, I need that box up there so I don't get lost. Uh, well, we're gonna get a mu plus um, pi one plus pi two plus tau one plus tau two plus lambda two. All right, and this is all divided by two. I guess I'm gonna get two mu's one for each, uh, and then I'm going to get a subtraction, and I'm going to have the other column, which is going to be a 2 mu plus pi 1 plus pi 2 
plus tau 1 plus tau 2 plus lambda 1 all divided by 2 and if we cancel out everything we're left with just lambda 2 minus lambda 1 divided by 2. Hmm. So what we have here is that if we take this kind of goofy looking test statistic up here, which is the difference of two averages, then it turns out that the expected value of that is the difference of our two lambdas. And that means that we could actually run a, a t-test to sort this out. All right, so what you end up having here is just a two sample t-test, a two sample unpaired t-test. Great. Um, and you can kind of work it out that in this case we would have, I guess, I'm assuming that each sample has the same number of observations. Um, so ultimately you would have something like, well, that crazy test statistic up here, which, all right, I guess I can write it one more time, over 2 minus y bar 1, 1 plus y bar 2, 2 over 2, you're going to have to divide by the, um, well, the variance. I mean the square root of the estimated variance, which I'm going to write using terrible notation as the square root of var hat, because uh, I don't really want to have to write it all out. Or you can compute the, the, the sample variance of all these points, but it's just kind of annoying to get all the indices correct, so I'm not actually going to do it. Uh, and then you end up with a t-test, and how many degrees of freedom would you have? Well, in this case, you have a sample size of n, you have a sample size of another n, so you'd have 2n, but uh, you'd have to subtract 2, um, for the two, I guess, sample means that you're computing. In this case, I know there's like two times two, but you think of it, uh, there's, you're computing basically two things. Um, one mean, for, I mean, average of the two means, which is like a mean of means and then another mean of means. So you end up with something like 2n minus 2 or just capital N minus 2. Um, that is if the... Um, sample sizes are balanced here, um, and we have little n for each of them. Right, so then there's a, two ways to uh, um, proceed. So I think I said step one somewhere way up here. Yeah, somewhere way up here I said step one is test for a carryover effect. So that kind of makes you think there's a step two coming. Um, Right, so step two is if there is no significant carryover effect, then proceed to test the entire, then basically test the entire data set process proceed is the word the pro word i was looking for um to test i guess tau i or tau one equal to tau two or tau one not equal to tau two right this is what we actually want to test is is treatment one the same as treatment two or is there a significant difference um, and we would proceed using the entire data set, whereas this is, I guess, bullet point one and bullet the second bullet point, if there is a significant carryover effect, then only use round one data to test the same hypothesis. So the idea is that if there is a carryover effect in this setting, we're going to run into a problem. And that problem is that we're going to get a biased estimate out for our treatments tau. Um, so that's going to cause a problem if we want to use the entire data set to do hypothesis testing, 
on the treatment eff effect tau. So instead, what we do is we'd ignore the second half of the data set and just test based on the first half, which means this would be like a just a standard unpaired two sample t test um, with nothing else fancy going on. Ideally, we could use the whole data set because it would give us more statistical power and uh, you know more to test. But uh, the idea is, is that if you do have this carryover, it could ruin your results, so you don't want to do that. Now this um, this is due to someone named Grizzle from I guess like the 19 is it 1960s yeah say 1965 so it's kind of an old result um, and there are some issues about this people saying uh you know like do we actually want to do this um, are there better ways to approach it um, so a lot's been done since then and that leads us to the idea of well better designs <laughs> Okay, so instead of just doing this AB or BA type of test, can we do something more interesting? So instead of just AB slash BA, can we design a carryover? test or um, design, I guess, can we design a carryover, let's say experiment, so I'm not being redundant, or not a carryover, sorry, a crossover. I get those backwards because it's so easy to. Can we design a crossover experiment that allows for testing both treatment and carryover effects. Well, yes, yeah. <laughs> That's the idea is that, well, yeah, you can. Uh, you just have to work a little bit harder. Um, and there are multiple different types of designs you could use. Um, a few of these I'm just pulling out of a textbook um, just to show you that there are different types of extended versions that you could consider of this ABBA design. So I guess first of all I should say yes. And then also note that some um, such designs are, well there's one where we would still have our, well in this case we would have four groups of um, well, we would have groups one, two, three, and four, and we would still have two periods. <coughs> <coughs> or rounds. And in this case, what we would do is, well, we would test the group one is the AA group. Group two is the BB group. Group three is the AB group. And group four is the BA group. So in this case, what you could do is you could use this type of design in order to test for both, again, main, the, main, the main treatment effects and the carryover effects. Um, but you don't necessarily have to do it just like that. You could keep it to two groups. Let's say your data isn't divisible, your sample size isn't divisible by four, uh, and you'd rather just keep it to two groups. So in that case, you could have one and two, but you could extend the number of periods to one, two, three. And in this case, what we're going to do is we are going to subject um, our subjects to either A followed by B followed by B, or B, followed by A, followed by A. And there's even a third one that I've seen, well, that I see, <laughs> um, and there's probably even more. 
in this case, we would kind of have, well, we would have what, four different groups and three different sequences, and you might, one, two, three, four, and we would have round one, two, and three. And what we can do is we could run, say, A, B, 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 A, A. We can do a, um, where's the other one? A, A, B, A, B, and a B, B, A. And we could analyze these if we really wanted to by considering the fact that, um, remember, we approach it the same way as we did above with just the A, B, B, A um, setting, right? Each square corresponds to some y bar ij. Because each of these squares, we're going to have multiple subjects receiving that treatment in that round, the being in that group in that round, that is. So once again, what we can do is we can take an average. That will average out the noise, the epsilon, the random subject effect. And then we just have to figure out the right way to add and subtract our y bars in order to get a test statistic for whatever we want to test. Um, and that's, in some sense, more or less the whole idea that I was trying to go for for this type of design. All right, so this gives you an idea of many different ways to run a crossover design if you have two different treatments to test. But as we started this section, we might have more. We might have four or five or so on. So then the question is, well, how do you proceed? Well, again, what we would want to do is we would want to use one of those Latin squares, but we want to make sure that every treatment is followed by every other treatment an equal number of times um, to have that kind of balance that we talked about before, that more balanced. Um, now, it's been shown that that can only happen if T is, if the number of treatments is even, right? If the, if, um, if it's odd, what you can do is you could actually have two Latin squares running simultaneously. So I'm going to go through that and something called um, Williams, Williams's Latin square. Williams's, which is the apostrophe after the S, um, Latin square, just because I think this is kind of neat. Um, now, of course, if you really want one of these designs, you can go into an R package, push a button, and it will just spit one out for you. But it's always kind of neat to see how they are constructed, I think. Also, a lot of this relies on things like Galois theory, which is awesome. Shout out to Everest Galois, um, who's been, I guess, dead for a really long time. He died at the age of like 20 or something, and yet still has an entire textbooks, um, entire textbooks in algebra named Galois theory after the guy. So um, if you ever feel like you haven't accomplished that much, don't read up on Galois biography, or then you're really going to feel um, like you need to get more work done. Um, anyway, uh, let's just talk about how you might construct a Latin square design. And there's actually an algorithm um, due to um, Williams. And the idea is that we can start with just a cyclic Latin square. So let's do a four by four one like we started with. A, B, C, D. And what we're going to, what I mean by cyclic is that I'm just going to keep shifting um, this every um, by one. So what I mean by that is I'm going to shift it by one, B, C, D, A. I'm going to shift it again to get a C, D, A, B. I'm going to shift it again to get a D, A, B, C. So again, this square would be okay if we weren't worried about crossover effects, but because we might want to worry that crossover effects could be possible, even if they're not, um, even if they're not actually there, we might want to just design an experiment so that we could at least 
account for that if they do occur, because a priori we may not know if there are going to be any crossover effects. So the idea is you first start with this, and then what we do is we do a mere image of it. So this is kind of neat. D, C, B, A, A, D, C, B, B, A, D, C, and then C, B, B, just to emphasize, A, D. Okay, so now we have the mere image of that square. And now what we're going to do is we're going to interlace each of the rows of the first Latin square with a row of the second Latin square to get basically um, a giant rectangle. So effectively what we're going to do is we're going to do this one, A, B, C, D. Then we're going to do this one, D, A, B, C. Um, and then so on, we're going to do the second row, or the second column, that is, B, C, D, A. And then we're going to do the second column, C, D, A, B. And then we're going to well continue on in this fashion to get a C D A B A B C D A A D A B C and an A B C D. All right. What does that get us? <laughs> All right. So by using this algorithm, what we've done is we've effectively created two new Latin squares. Now, if we use the same orientation that we did before, it wouldn't really work in the sense that we have an A, B, and an A, B. But what happened here is that I realized that I actually did it sideways. I need to transpose the square. So if we transpose the square, that is, um, right, transpose it as we would a matrix, then what we would get out is something that looks like A, D, B, C, B, A, C, D, C, B, D, A, and D, C, a, B. And then we can use this to be rounds 1, 2, 3, and 4 for the, I'll say, period, and um, our groups 1, 2, 3, and 4. And now if we stare at this, hopefully we see that every um, possible predecessor comes before every um, given treatment. So we have D followed by A, we have D follow, or D after A, D after C, D after B, and D of course just starting off group number four. Now you could also use the second square if you really wanted to, um, but you don't have to. But what will happen though is the idea that if you, this, um, well, This works for um, an even number of treatments. But if it's an odd number, it's not quite going to work out in this nice balanced fashion. What you will get out is you can, though, achieve the same thing by using two Latin squares simultaneously. So if the number of treatments is odd, 
we can use two Latin squares to get this balance condition that we're interested in. In this case, what we would have is we would have something that looks like, let's see if we can have it written down somewhere else so I don't have to actually construct it by hand. Let's do ABC, so AC, B, um, B, A, C, C, B, A. So that might be one we would try, but we would note here that um, A is followed by C twice and, or yeah, A, or sorry, I always say that backwards. C is followed, or which way are we talking about? Yeah, A is, no, I said it right the first time. A is followed by C twice. Um, B is followed by A twice. And um, C is followed by B twice. Um, so we don't have the other ones, but we can get the other ones by having a slightly different Latin square that looks like, let's see if we can get this right, B, C, A, C, A, yeah, B, and I think A, B, C, A, B, C. So now, if you look at these squares combined into a like super square, I guess not really a square, it's a rectangle now, um, you would have that B um, is followed by, well, A has B come before it twice. We have on this side, A has C come before it twice. And there's two situations where A just starts the whole thing. So now, if we use both of these Latin squares simultaneously, we can achieve that same balance condition. So for odd numbers, we have to work a little bit harder. For even numbers, we can work with just a single Latin square. And again, the idea that we have in mind here is that we want to have the ordering, that sort of that ordering balanced so that we can test to see if there are any carryover effects in our data, or at least if we can account for them, um, because otherwise we won't be able to. All right, so that's more or less everything I wanted to say about this idea of crossover designs. There's a lot more that you could get into in this area, but just for the sake of giving you an overview, it gives you an idea of how you could run a design where you can actually test every treatment on every subject. And there is something nice about that because it allows you to control a bit for the within subject variation or between subject variation. I always get those two backwards. The idea being that every person in your study is going to have some random effect of their own that they're bringing into it. Now, if you only measure a subject once, you can't account for that random effect. But if you measure a subject multiple times, then you can account for that random effect. And in this way, you can see how a subject will respond to every different treatment. Now, there's always the issue that you can't do this independently. You can't split a subject into four identical copies of him or herself and subject them to each one of the treatments. You only get one copy of each subject and you have to subject them to all the treatments in some order. And the idea of an optimal crossover design is one that has a lot of interest in it because it's very relevant in a lot of different medical studies. Again, these sensory ones you see people discuss a lot where people are basically testing food and telling you what they think. Um, but a lot of other um, types of studies as well where you would see this work in practice. It brings into the idea of the Latin square as before, but with a little bit more um, constraints. There are packages in R. I'm not going to go into them now, but if you want to look them up, you can find, I think one's called cross design and one's called cross des. Um, and you can even find some um, 
um, crossover design data in some of the design of experiment R packages if you want to look at some toy data and try it out yourself. Right, so that is the end of all the lecture materials that I had in mind. Thank you so much for watching all of them or at least the last five minutes of the last one that I'm doing now. Um, regardless, I'm not done yet. I will be putting up one more epilogue um, le lecture, which will just be an overview of everything we've talked about, trying to refresh your mind, memory on some of the key points so you don't have to binge watch all of these again to try to remember everything that I was rambling on about for the last 30 plus hours. Um, so we'll be doing that. And then if we'll be, I guess, ending the uh, the course, it's kind of uh, a big surprise now, since it seems like uh, at one point it was so far away and now it's uh, we are here. Um, but yeah, I hope you've all learned a lot. Um, but definitely stick around for the recap lecture because that might be one of the more useful ones as uh, I'll try to focus in on all of the key points from all of the different lectures um, to give you a sense of where we started, where we went, or where we traveled, and where we ended up at the end of all of this. So I will see you in the final lecture.